Welcome back to Real Estate Appraisal Principles and Procedures. This is your instructor, Matt Boxberger. And for Session 7, which covers Chapter 5 in our book, we'll talk about the real estate marketplace. Now, what do we mean by marketplace? Th there's a few elements that we'll cover. We'll talk about real estate markets and why real estate uh, is a different kind of asset or commodity than most others and what elements of that makes the marketplace unique. Then we'll talk a bit about market analysis, how and what we look at in the real estate market to determine the demand or the value that we can expect for real estate. We'll talk again about real estate financing, and in particular here because financing, the availability or lack of it, can impact significantly the value that real estate will command, as most real estate is financed. We'll talk then about some economic theory, if you will, the the way you can break down the elements that create value in a in a thing in a commodity like real estate we'll talk about the different kinds of value that we may have to appraise market value being the most common one but as we'll see there's a number of others that may need to be appraised and and would be different than the classic market value we'll talk about the different factors that influence real estate value and some basic principles that you have to consider when you're determining value, market value in particular. So let's get started by talking about the market for real estate. There's some important characteristics that are highlighted. Overall what you can say about the real estate market as contrasted with many other markets is that the market is inefficient. And what do we mean by that? Every parcel of real estate is unique in some way so that they aren't interchangeable, they're not a true commodity. The number of buyers and sellers in the market at any time varies and frequently is a small enough number that one market participant can bump up or down the values so that there's more variability in each individual transaction price. Again, contrast this with a more commodity-like market for shoes, say, where you could go to a number of different places to buy the same shoe and you have a fairly steady demand of, of and demand for the product. In real estate, the third point here, many buyers and sellers are unsophisticated and this means they may not understand all of the important elements that may impact the value of property and again this contributes to more variability in each individual transaction price. Real estate is intensely regulated. There's a lot of things that you cannot do with real estate. We talked about zoning, the types of property you can, uh, or the types of businesses you can build, the limitations, things like setbacks from the curb and so on. And so the underlying theme there is with the intense regulation, what looks like to nearly identical parcels may not be because of zoning or other regulations that apply to one but not the other. And then the last point is that although obvious real estate is immobile. So you hear the phrase in real estate it's location, location, location. You may like a lot in some elements, nice view of the river, but you can't move that because it happens to be too close to the freeway and pull that someplace else. So again this ties back to that first point of every parcel of real estate being unique. With much of this in the chapter it's important to understand these principles. You won't be writing about them in every appraisal report you do but it's important when there are differences that you need to explain them. And if you think about it, each appraisal is going to have a subject property and a number of comparable properties, and there'll be differences between each of those. And so understanding 
what elements impact value and if those differ between the subject property and the comparables or between several of the comparables helps you understand what kind of adjustment you have to make so that you're as nearly equivalent with the comparisons you make. So now let's move on to the next topic which is market analysis and market analysis is frequently a big part of what's called feasibility studies where you're looking at changing what's on a particular parcel either building something when you don't have something there or tearing down what's there and building something different or improving what's there uh, with residential appraisals you typically don't get into a deep level of market analysis but the market reporting will be important you'll be called on to report the number of similar homes that have sold in the past uh, three months six months and past year the days on market which is a good indication of the supply demand balance the trends in the price levels all of these are indicators of market conditions and give some clues as to the the future direction of the market and the appropriate adjustments for the the time of sale if your comparables uh, sold some number of months prior to the the subject then you'd want to make adjustments based on on the price levels and the change in market conditions you had seen over that period. But again, understanding the elements here and what makes a market and what may differentiate the market that your subject property is in from what one of the comparables is in is important. So demography is one of the key tools. The demographics is the the analysis of what the population is like in the elements that impact value. What's the age of the population? What's the income of the population? Things that can impact the ability to buy real estate are, is what's important when you're doing a market analysis. Segmentation then is saying we may have a, a city or an area that we're looking at, but how do we segment or define and, and refine the overall markets? Are there school district boundaries that we need to consider, uh, age of homes, location to other amenities like shopping centers? So you, you in a market analysis, you want to look at what segment of the population may be attracted to the type of property you're looking at. So again, if there's demographics in play that would say only the the people that are 55 or older are going to be interested in this home because there's some age restrictions on it or uh, potential buyers of a new apartment complex if you build it. Those kind of uh, segments where you say for this particular segment or portion of the population this particular type of property may be in demand that that's what's involved there and then forecasts uh, again you may hear with appraisals that uh, appraising is looking backwards reporting what's happened and what what the current conditions are but sometimes in in appraisals or real estate consulting you're asked to make a, a forecast of what does the future look like in terms of the elements that will impact real estate values and so this idea of market analysis helps us uh, both with typical appraisals and with some of the more specialized ones so now the next topic in market analysis is the kind of studies you might do absorption analysis is is an analysis of the number and the, the time period or the rate that a particular kind of property will be sold or leased. So if you're looking at building an apartment complex or a condominium complex, looking at what are the demand drivers, the demographics, how many people are there, how frequently have houses been selling, and the supply analysis, are there other 
competing projects that are on the market or coming on the market, how fast will the developer be able to sell the individual units? And the, the feasibility study uh, more broadly would look at using real estate for one purpose or another. Maybe it's condos, maybe it's apartments, maybe it's building a, a shopping center. And so the feasibility study is, is you typically think of that as, as a broader kind of report or analysis. And that would include an absorption analysis and the demographics uh, and those kind of things that, that broadly would determine what's the highest and best use. We'll get into that term and describe that a little bit further uh, today. So now moving on to real estate finance and some of this we had mentioned in earlier chapters but f in particular in the marketplace uh, as I mentioned in my introduction the, the financing impacts value because the majority of real estate is not purchased all cash that the buyers will need to borrow money to purchase the real estate. And so the important elements here are the, the cost of credit, meaning what's the interest rate. Uh, obviously that impacts the prices buyers can pay because the higher the interest rate, the higher the monthly payment for a given amount of money you want to borrow. And so as the cost of credit goes up, that can depress the real estate market. Either prices go down or the numbers of properties that sell will go down. And you talk about credit being tight when there's not enough financing for all the potential buyers or as in the current conditions when the underwriting requirements uh, are, are stricter than they had been before. So while a, a buyer may have the same income level as he had a few years ago, there may be other elements uh, in terms of his credit profile or uh, other assets that, that would prevent him from getting financing where he may have been able to in the past. And then they talk a bit about sources of capital here. That's not as important. It, it introduces the term of a money market for short-term loans that a developer might take out for a, a year or two to build a project and capital markets which are the longer term sources of, of funding that are typically used in a residential mortgage. And then that investments can come from debt investors, meaning they loan the money but just expect to get interest back at a lower rate of return because there's less risk than the equity investors who would take a portion of the risk or uh, a portion of the uh, appreciation in an investment. The, the key here is that uh, real estate competes with other investments. So for example an insurance company that would have a large amount of money from premiums being paid in from policyholders that they may not need for several years, say it's a life insurance company, can look at investing that money in real estate, which they frequently do, or in alternative investments, uh, short-term investments if they pay a, a good rate of interest. So those factors can also impact real estate prices but in a less direct way typically than the, uh, than the cost of credit that a borrower is looking at. So now they, they go into a little bit of detail on mortgage terms and concepts. For appraising it's not as important but just to understand the real estate market it's thrown in here so hypothecate is a term they introduce and that's where you pledge or promise to to repay a loan and you give the uh, title to your re to your real estate to either the lender or to a, a third party to hold until you pay off that debt so the term hypothecate is introduced there. Now there's two primary ways that mortgages are done. There's what's described at the bottom of this slide where there's two parties, a mortgagor and a mortgagee. Uh, this is not the, the system used in California but it is in some other states. So remember the, the OR suffix we talked about, that's the person that creates or does this thing. So if you're buying a home you get a mortgage. You, so you mortgage the home, you create a lien in favor of the mortgagee, the lender, and then if there's a default the mortgagee goes to court 
to get an order to foreclose on the property and sell it. So as I mentioned again there in some states this is how it's done. Now the next slide will talk about the system in California where there's three parties. A deed of trust is used, although the, the transaction is still called a mortgage. You, the, the property owner, are the trustor and you transfer that deed or transfer the title to the property to the trustee. This is a third party who holds this on behalf of the lender who's called the beneficiary and then if there's a default there's laws but those spell out exactly what has to be done in each case and typically you don't have to go to a court to enforce it so the trustees deed sale is how the uh, the property is sold to repay the debt if there's a foreclosure or if the trustor pays off the loan then the trustee returns the deed or the title to the property to the owner. So those are introduced here again kind of a, uh, a tangent to the overall idea of, of financing but just, just tells about how it's done and the terms associated with it. So then they move in and as I mentioned before there's a number of terms here. Uh, this is some fundamental economics and these kind of things apply to not just real estate but any kind of property. The, the important thing to keep in mind as you're looking at this is these things may differ between a property you're appraising and one of the comparables and so you need to keep those in mind. Are there differences that need to be analyzed and adjusted for? So this elements that create value, there's four of them and they use the acronym DUST, Demand, Utility, Scarcity, and Transferability. And as I say at the bottom, all four elements have to be present for the commodity, in this case real estate, to have value. And as we'll talk about, there's different kinds of value, but this is typically value in exchange, meaning exchange for money, i.e. The, the market value. Now if you go back and again think about this, if any of these are missing, then an item won't have value. If there's not demand, if, if there's not buyers who are capable of buying a property, then there's not a market for it. You may hold it until that changes, but it has to be there for it to have, have value now. Utility as well. The property has to serve a useful purpose. Uh, if the utility of the property is reduced, i.e. The, the home burns down, that reduces the value. Scarcity, there has to be a limit to how much is available in order to create demand and create value. So, you know, sand, there's uh, in small quantities no scarcity of that, so you're not going to get somebody to pay you for a handful of sand. Uh, it's not scarce enough. And transferability, that the title can be moved. So if there's a lien on property and it can't be transferred without someone else's permission or payment to someone else, or if the property has been condemned then it can't be transferred and there will be no value there that you can can realize by selling it in the market. Uh, there may have been value to the government entity that condemned a piece of property that they're going to use for a freeway but the value then is to them and uh, not to uh, someone else who, who wants to use the home long term. So next we have a table here and it just serves to illustrate that there are a lot of types of value. I, I note we might appraise several of them. Certainly market value there is the the most common one. Uh, I put in bold the other ones that you might have a case to appraise. Assessed value uh, can vary based on the taxing authority and you may be called in to say is the assessed value now above the market value should it be adjusted. Uh, insurance value, typically a insurance company will want to, want to know what are the improvements worth so the total value of a property may be a million bucks but if the land is worth 600,000 then you'd only insure the 400,000 for the the home or the uh, the replacement value of the improvements. Moving on down, uh, leased fee and leasehold values we talked about when a property is rented out the landlord has the, the leased fee estate and that can have some value 
the tenant has a leasehold estate and that can have some value different from the uh, the market value. Uh, liquidation value sometimes in REOs, bank owned property, they'll want to know what's the value of the home if I have to sell it within 60 days where the typical days on market may be a year and so as an appraiser you may be asked to look for other similar transactions that were done quickly and make an estimate of the liquidation value that's probably going to be below the market value. Value in use means the value to a specific entity or for a specific purpose. You'll see this a lot in a large industrial property where a particular building for a specialized use has, has value there. Uh, for example, up at the Numi plant in Fremont, the, the value in use was a lot higher than when the auto making operations moved out and it was just a, a giant building with some equipment in it. So value in use can be used within a company or as part of analyzing the overall value of a business. Investment value will take into account the financing. So a particular buyer with a particular kind of loan may have mortgage payments of a certain amount and then if the the rent they can get from the property is above that uh, that there's some net profit and that can have a value to them but if some other buyer had a different kind of financing structure the the investment value to them may be different so value and use and the investment value typically think of those in terms of to a particular entity or, or a particular kind of use uh, going concern value is a phrase that takes into account both personal and real property. So a, a kind of value there might be for a, a service station or service station in mini market where there's real property, the land, the buildings, maybe the the underground tanks in some cases, and then there's personal property. There's the uh, there's the inventory that's being sold, and there may be goodwill. Maybe you're operating under the the Chevron name, and that brings you in customers who are confident in that name. So the going concern value would take in those elements as well. So again, this uh, is an overview of the types of value and the fact that the same property on the same day may have different values depending on whether we're looking at the market value, the assessed value, the insurable value, etc. So when you're doing appraisals that's one of the requirements that you establish up front. What is the uh, the type of value and what's the definition of the value that you're going to appraise or express an opinion on. So now market value as I said is the most common one. The, the full definition here and the, the key phrase is most probable there when you see that. So the most probable price which a property should bring in a competitive and open market under all conditions requisite to a fair sale, the buyer and seller each acting prudently and knowledgeably and assuming the price is not affected by undue stimulus. <sighs> so long definition, a lot of it common sense, but again if you're looking at a comparable sale that was on the market for a very short time where all the other properties were on for a longer time you may want to investigate why was that was it priced low and the seller was under some distress and needed to sell it fairly quickly or were there other elements in play a all cash overseas buyer who came in and and made an over the asking price offer again to establish whether that transaction that you're looking at represents market value or not. Now arm's length transaction is another requirement of market value and although the term arm's length wasn't used in the definition we just looked at it expands on some of the elements that are uh, listed there. So for an arm's length transaction the key points are that the buyer and seller are typically motivated meaning they're not under distress they don't have a deadline they have to sell or buy buy that they're well informed or well advised and acting in their best interest that there's not 
uh, some reason that they want to make the transaction happen at a price lower than normal or higher than normal and that they understand all the things that a, a typical well-informed buyer or seller would know about the the market and the property uh, the third item that it's been on the market uh, they say exposed to the market for a reasonable amount of time and so in appraisal sometimes you'll see a transaction that's in the public records but not in the MLS so there may have been some kind of private negotiations and a, a potential buyer approached the seller directly and negotiated a deal now that may still be an arm's length transaction but if it's not possible to determine if the the seller shopped it around looked for other potential buyers or not it, it's, it could be an area of concern that might indicate the price was not a typical market value transaction number four that the payments made in terms of cash in US dollars or the equivalent so that there's not a kind of barter where it's not clear what what the item bartered for was worth so so again to establish that this is uh, typical in terms of the uh, the value received we peg it or say that it needs to be recorded in dollars or the equivalent and then finally that there's no uh, special financing concessions or terms or if there are that it is adjusted for so the the seller may have a property that uh, a typical buyer couldn't normally get bank financing for the seller may offer to finance a portion of it carry a portion of it at a, at a lower interest rate for example and so you can adjust for that you can figure out what's the 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 implied difference in price because you got a lower interest loan but you need to understand that and and adjust for it if that is the case so now I wanted to add one more slide here because these terms get a little bit confusing or at least the differentiation gets confusing so let's go through the price the cost the value all of them will be in dollars but but what's the difference so price is what a property actually sells for and as I say it could have been a non arm's length or a distressed transaction so it's for that specific property for that specific transaction now cost is referring to the amount that was paid for a property in the past and what was paid by the current owner and that may not be its value and it may not be the price that the next buyer will pay for it now so so cost think of that as as looking back what what did the current owner pay for it and then value is the element that the appraiser looks at and there can be different kinds of value that may be above or below the the price that's being paid or the cost that was paid for a piece of property so now we'll go into the influences on real estate value and another acronym remember to have value it had to have dust and then the things that can influence that value you can remember with pegs P for physical or environmental influences things like the the climate uh, the hazards that are present on the the property or adjacent to it economic influences this has to do with the normal cycles of the economy interest rates as we talked about earlier government and legal influences and this is typically one of the biggest ones what are the zoning regulations what are the taxes or fees that are being uh, assessed on the property and then social this talks about the the market preferences the the demographics as we talked about earlier and these things change over time so are you in a neighborhood where there's increasing demand because there's more 
young people moving in who prefer that type of property. There's more retirees moving in that prefer that type of property. So those factors as well can influence the real estate value. And again, I'll go back to my point earlier. It's important to understand these things where there may be some differences in those influences between properties you're looking at as your subject or as potential comparable sales to look at. Now the next area, again there's a lot of terms here which are interrelated and often overlap both in their meaning and in the impact or effect that they're describing. We'll talk through them, they're kind of basic economic terms. Uh, for me, my opinion is these tend to be one of the more confusing areas of appraisal and economic texts. On a common sense level you can understand them but sometimes segregating them or saying this is the element that's most at play in this case or scenario can be a little more difficult. But again I'll stress these as important to understand, not necessarily to memorize, but as they come into play when comparing properties to each other. Now I moved up the order of substitution from where it appeared in the book. Uh, substitution is one of these eight or so principles that are listed, but it's the, the most important one. Substitution says if I'm a potential buyer and I'm looking at two homes that to me look identical, and home A is priced at 400,000 but home B is priced at 350, I can easily substitute it, substitute B for A, and so I'll want to buy B. So I won't pay any more than I have to. So if there's a number of homes on the market, the buyer will pay the least he can to get the features that are important to him. So substitution ties into comparable. When you're looking at properties in your appraisal report, you want to make sure they're ones that conceivably the buyer or a buyer for your property could substitute in. Now there'll be adjustments because as we talked about with the real estate market there's inefficiencies and no two properties are identical so you need to to make those adjustments but again that's normal in the market and you say we, we can see this range of prices and we can figure out what a bedroom was worth or a bathroom was worth or a swimming pool and make those adjustments. But once those are done, uh, a property that a uh, net of the adjustments is priced higher will not sell before one that's priced lower will sell. So substitution is going to be the key one and that kind of gives you a framework to understand how we analyze these other ones that are listed here anticipation and again think of these as what may come into play for a potential buyer of the property. Are, are there expected changes in the property or the market that may impact what the property is worth to me and consequently the price I'll pay for it. Balance again it's a it's a generic term isn't it but it, it, it comes into play where we'll talk about factors of production that those things are in balance or uses are in balance so if you've already got you know three auto dealerships on a on a street uh, do you need a fourth one is there a balance or would a uh, would a home improvement center work better so it's a way of, of looking at and comparing properties and saying you know what would this be important to uh, to a potential buyer change again another obvious one and this kind of ties back to anticipation as well what are, are things changing in the market that are going to impact value. Competition, this, this ties back to those ideas of supply and demand. Is there competition for buyers that, that may drive the price up or competition among sellers so that that may drive the, the price down? Uh, so, so looking at those, what's, what's the, the level of, of buyers and sellers for the, the real estate in the market will come into play. Conformity, progression, and regression are, are grouped together. This talks about, and, and you may have seen these scenarios described, typically if you're building a home you'll want it to conform with others in the neighborhood. If there's a home that's somewhat nicer than those in the neighborhood, 
that may pull up other in the neighborhood may, may bring up values overall and regression on the other hand if there's a home that's in somewhat worse condition than others in the neighborhood that will will bring down the price not only for it but for others in the neighborhood i had heard the recommendation that you'll want to buy a home that's a little bit worse than the others in the neighborhood you'll get a a better value for your dollar because those other nicer or bigger homes will tend to to pull up the price of your home if it, if it meets your needs. Now continuing with these uh, value principles, you've got the principle of contribution. The key idea here is that an improvement is worth only what it adds, not its cost necessarily, or it could be more than its cost. So an example, if uh, homes in a neighborhood typically have two bathrooms, but you have a home that only has one, buyers will typically look for two, and so the cost for you to add a second one may, may add more value to your home than the actual cost. But on the other hand, if you've already got four bathrooms and most in the neighborhood have two or three, if you had a fifth one, that's probably not going to add that much more incremental value to your home externalities that refers to things outside the property itself things like the schools or the school districts the crime rates that obviously have an impact on value even though they're not a part of the the property itself so now I've got the little dash there because that that lists those basic value principles and then in the book they go on to to a few more kind of uh, standalone ideas about uh, value and valuing property. There's these four factors of production. Capital, meaning the, the amount of money that needs to be put in. Labor, meaning the employees that need to work. The, the land, meaning you need to have a place for a business. And then management. So uh, in a commercial appraisal, obviously, there's all of these in play. Or building a home, there's all of those in play. And so uh, as you're valuing property, I think the, the key uh, point here is that, that land is one piece of it. You need to have the land there, but then t to give it value, you're going to need some capital, some money to build the improvements. If it's a business, you're going to need labor uh, either to run the business or to, to build the, uh, the improvements. And then you'll need some management, some supervision. Uh, that, that coordinates, or sometimes they'll call that coordination, that coordinates these factors. The next kind of standalone idea is that a neighborhood will go through these stages of growth as it's initially being built and sold and demand is growing. Equilibrium as prices stabilize, conditions stabilize. Decline as properties get older and need more maintenance and then potentially I put it in in italics here revitalization so you'll see some areas that will revitalize the older homes will be torn down and new ones will be built because the the area is still desirable the schools are desirable in others uh, it may not revitalize it may be changed to a different kind of use the current properties torn down and and perhaps reused for some some different use but again that idea of looking at a neighborhood and determining uh, what stage is it in because that will impact the demand and, and the values that the properties have in that neighborhood is important. And then highest and best use or HBU, it's, some, it's frequently abbreviated in uh, appraisal discussions. That's determining if you've got a piece of property, is it at its highest and best use? The, the value is typically going to be determined if the property is at its highest and best use or start from there and then make some deductions if it's not at its highest and best use. And so you have, as I say there, you have to study many of the above items to determine what's the highest and best use. Again, if it's uh, an auto dealership in an area where the other auto dealerships are struggling, the highest and best use may not be to continue it as an auto dealership. It may be to tear it down and build a home improvement center. And, and so th again, this comes with uh, real estate consulting and in some of the more complex commercial jobs typically with residential appraising if the property is in a in an area 
of similar homes and the zoning says it's to be used for residential, then you can confidently state the property is at its highest and best use as a single family residence. Another item, this law of increasing returns and decreasing returns, that has to do a bit with what we talked about earlier where you can over improve a neighborhood as you put money into something expanding or adding the number of items you can get increasing returns but at some point if you think of a curve you reach the top of the curve and it starts to decline so that the additional dollar invested does not return a dollar of value opportunity costs the idea that there are different risks and different returns in different investments whether it be investing in real estate or investing in stock or in building a property as a condominium complex versus building it as a as an apartment complex uh, supply and demand again this is fairly straightforward we talked about it earlier just understanding that that you'll need to look at what is the supply of properties and what is the demand from buyers and then one other kind of oddball term but it's thrown in in the chapter and we'll cover it here this idea of surplus productivity and what that means it's a way of valuing land by deducting the value of the other three agents of production we talked about those earlier this capital labor and management and so that's sometimes used in subdivision analysis figuring out does it make sense to buy this property over here for a million dollars if it's going to cost me this much in capital labor and uh, and management to uh, to build a an apartment complex that will return a certain amount and, and so in those scenarios the the forecasting and the assumptions really become important and segregating out each of the the pieces of the 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 value puzzle become important so surplus productivity is thrown in there that's saying after you've taken out all those other elements what's surplus what's left over that value must reside in the land and so with that then we'll wrap up this chapter that talks about the real estate market thanks a lot and we'll talk to you next time